Traditionally, the Enlightenment came first, then came the revolutions. But in today's Beijing, it's the other way around. The former Revolutionary History Museum on Tiananmen Square has been renamed the National Museum of China. Its courtyard has been enclosed, giving the building with its military contours and square colonnades a total of about 200,000 square meters floor space. Now it's said to be the biggest museum on earth. It's set to open on April 1st with a special exhibition, not a Chinese, but an international one. Its theme, the art of the enlightenment. The architects for the renovation were the Hamburg-based firm Gerkan, Mark and Partners. The exhibition is to run for one year. It's 600 works spanning the 18th century, when Europe threw off the yoke of political and religious absolutism. To bring the Enlightenment to Tiananmen Square, scene of the 1989 student protests that were crushed by the military with much bloodshed, it's a feat of logistics and at the same time a masterpiece of diplomacy. It's a cultural mission with a political edge. The Director General of the Dresden State Art Collections and a pioneer of cultural exchange with China talks about how to make foreign policy with art. It's almost routine for many other European countries, but for Germany, this is a first. He speaks for everyone involved. This king and it's important to emphasize that the initiative came from our Chinese partners. During a state visit by the German president at the time, Horst Köhler, they proposed that we sign a joint agreement on it, in the presence of Horst Köhler and Hu Jintao. So all the political maneuvering and the really intense effort that the former foreign minister Frank-Walter Steinmeier put into it paid off. He even got involved in the content aspect. These are very clear signals that politics and culture interact. And the support from the private sector was fabulous. Here we finally managed to get all the partners together on one side for a public exhibition. It's also a signal of interest in this topic, and it's a result of China's resonance with Germany, which I'm every bit as proud of as I am of the exhibition. And the importance is reflected in the funding structure. 80% of the financial support came from the German Foreign Ministry. The exhibition, The Art of the Enlightenment, is a 10 million euro gift from the German taxpayer, augmented by funding from sponsors. The National Museum of China is paying the insurance, but no loan fees. A radical departure from the usual practice for international exhibitions. But even the best laid plans often go awry. The opening of both museum and exhibition was postponed several times, which is only to be expected when dealing with such a large building and up to 30,000 visitors a day. It's a massive challenge, even by Chinese standards. It may seem paradoxical that Europe's intellectual awakening and striving for freedom would interest an authoritarian single-party system. On the one hand, it welcomes the Enlightenment, and on the other, it still shuns terms like civil society in the year 2011. In fact, there never was any such thing as an art of the Enlightenment. 18th century art may be Rococo or neoclassicist, prince or politics, idyll or inferno. The 600 works on display in Beijing represent the art of an epic, not an epic in art.
The European Enlightenment is in fact part of both the school and university curriculum in China. So the European Enlightenment is a concept here, especially as manifested in literature and philosophy, by Lessing and Kant among the Germans and of course by Rousseau among the French. So they have these points of reference. But for this exhibition, we set ourselves the task of investigating and pursuing the interpretation and visualization of the Enlightenment in images, its effects on art and European culture and contemporary thought. We worked on that with our Chinese counterparts and I think we came up with a good concept. The Chinese are well aware and openly acknowledge that the European Enlightenment had a global significance for the cultural systems of the world. Humans and their self-determination in society and the universe are very closely connected with the thinking of the Enlightenment. The freedom and self-determination of people as individuals are inconceivable without the French Revolution and the European Enlightenment. Die Selbstbestimmung des Menschen als Individuum ist ohne die französische Revolution und die europäische Aufklärung nicht denkbar. But individual liberty and self-determination in China is still a long way off. In Beijing, enlightenment is still just about art, not reality. Unpacking and examining the German museum's treasures is down to the Germans themselves. Any enthusiasm on the Chinese side is still purely academic. We look after the exhibits until they're in the display case or on the wall. After that, it's the National Museum's responsibility. So our Chinese counterparts and the Chinese restorers are on hand to examine the piece's condition and sign for them, or they notice things that they want written down. And when we take down the exhibition in a year's time, we'll be doing the return handover, and our Chinese counterparts have to be able to show that everything has remained unchanged. The moment China rose to become a world power, it was advisable for it to get acquainted with the conceptual foundations of its partners in the global arena. This has a long tradition. During the Enlightenment in the 18th century, Jesuits traveled to China to establish contact. And the chinoiserie that appeared in the art of the European courts became world famous in the 18th century. Those are some of the most precious objects. The concept of the exotic contains the idea of the far away. In the 18th century, China played the part of the exotic land. And it still does today. But of course, the philosophical development of society is different in Europe from what it was in China. On the one hand, the Beijing exhibition is about the significance of art in the Enlightenment, and on the other, it's about the significance of the Enlightenment for art after the Enlightenment. Both are fascinating themes for European cultural and intellectual history.
The 18th century was a time of unparalleled revolution in art and media. New media were invented, steel and wood engraving and lithography, for example. That allowed images to be reproduced in numbers inconceivable in the previous centuries. All at once, art became a mass medium and started exerting a powerful influence on public thought. Just as fascinating is the thesis that the mindscape of the 18th century, the ideas of the Enlightenment, decisively influenced our idea of art down to the present day. In fact, the mindscape of the 20th century and early 21st century is still made by Enlightenment. The history of art is the history of ideas as well. But only gradually did the ideas of the Enlightenment begin appearing in the imagery of the 18th century. Long bound to the courts of the nobility, art tended to be conservative. The Beijing exhibition reflects this. It illustrates an epic that proved a turning point for Europe, but does not analyze it. It cautiously introduces the Chinese viewer to a delicate subject matter. Ganz am Anfang, um when we started, we had to decide between two very different exhibition concepts. We could have done the whole thing chronologically and told the story of the 18th century from 1700 to 1800, but we could never figure out when exactly the Enlightenment began and when it ended. It seemed much more fruitful for us to divide the exhibition into thematic sections. We have a chapter called Near and Far. It's about European art's first encounter with art from beyond Europe. Just imagine, in the 18th century, Chinese art suddenly began rippling into the European art world. The China trend became one of the main trends of the 18th century. Leibniz even idealized China as the Europe of the East. It was no different for the Chinese side. China was a highly advanced civilization and it too realized for the first time in the 18th century that there was a parallel civilization over in Europe. So China also became aware of the world's diversity in the 18th century and of the necessity for the tolerance it needed to exist with that diversity. The nearly 2,500 square meters of exhibition space gives all the pieces adequate room. And the generous layout allows us to put together a synopsis of the widely differing types of objects. We shouldn't regard this exhibition in Beijing as a conventional exhibition of paintings or prints. These conventional forms serve to separate the media from one another instead of bringing them together. So for us too, this exhibition is a kind of strategic experimental lab. We're developing an exhibition format that doesn't exist yet in Germany in this form. Entwickeln da ein Ausstellungsformat, das es so in Deutschland noch gar nicht gibt. In our National Museum here in China, the emphasis is on history as well as art. We've mixed genres here in the past but offering single genres such as painting alone or sculpture alone makes it hard to put across an overall impression of an epic in Chinese history. So after some consultation, our German counterparts also chose this kind of exhibition format for the 18th century. Chinoiserie and puppet theaters from Dresden stand next to paintings from Munich, or marbles and costumes from Berlin. 
commemorative coins, porcelain tableware, early scientific instruments like a camera obscura, a vacuum pump or an electrostatic generator, or an early globe where the name of China isn't even mentioned. The art of the Enlightenment is conceived as a lighthearted stroll through a century that few Chinese are familiar with. Whenever possible, replicas offer the opportunity to touch and explore. The objects represent high art and everyday life. They can be sentimental bric-a-brac or precious items from life at court. European museums, art objects are normally grouped by type and form, and the institutions work independently. What's different about this exhibition is its public funding and diplomatic aim of deepening the dialogue with China the world power and China the marketplace. The cooperation between three of Germany's largest museum networks is also a departure from business as usual. It proved every bit as complicated to work out as the cooperation with China, starting with the selection of pieces to loan and on through the transport logistics and compiling the catalog. On the outside, it may have looked like peace and harmony, but on the inside, it took a strict but delicate touch to avoid stepping on anyone's toes. What's extraordinary about this exhibition is the fact that the big three German museum networks got together on a joint effort, which right from the start and through the entire process was not only the goal, but their entire approach. I'd see it as the highest compliment if the specific contributions that Berlin, Dresden or Munich have made to the exhibition could no longer be recognized, except maybe by the objects the various collections have lent. Here I'm standing in front of one of the prime objects in the exhibition. It came from the Berlin collection, Heinrich Danica by Christian Gottlieb Schick. It played a key role in the imagery of the 19th century, almost right up to the reception of the French Revolution's ideals. You could say it's the icon of the exhibition, Schick's Heinrich Danecker. It's the icon of the exhibition in the sense that it so convincingly expresses the Enlightenment's image of mankind through art, in fact like no other work in the exhibition. It's a sculptor's wife, portrayed by a painter in the colors of the French Revolution, free on a hilltop, free of all society's constraints, entirely preoccupied with herself. That's the new human being of the Enlightenment. China's pictorial tradition is different from Europe's. We try to select the works so they provide the Chinese viewers with a red thread through the historical epic and social origins of the Enlightenment. With this help, the viewers see how the works relate to one another and they can gain a deeper understanding of history. In the run-up to the opening, the Chinese media have been reporting extensively on the exhibition. Official circles, less so. 
It was important for us to include the perspective that the Enlightenment was not completed with the end of the 18th century. Its impact reaches into the 20th century. The sciences that saw their birth in the 18th century have developed further. Of course, the same applies to the arts. In the 20th century, art is no longer about the representational quality, but about meditations that focus on the art medium itself. And of course, that started a revolution that only serves to reveal how virulent all these questions remain today. It's still all about the freedom of art, the freedom of thought, about creating opportunities for a society to develop democratically, and about allowing the individual to find his or her place in society on the one hand, and on the other hand, about how societies have to work in relation to one another. When people hear that an exhibition on the art of the Enlightenment is in preparation for Beijing, everyone's first thought is provocation. But this exhibition was never seen as a provocation by our Chinese counterparts at the National Museum or as an ideological interloper. On the contrary, our Chinese counterparts have given us the feeling again and again that the Enlightenment is an indispensable part of their own national awareness. The Marxist thought from which 20th century Chinese history drew its dynamism is viewed by our Chinese colleagues as a legacy of the Enlightenment. So to Chinese viewers, the topic of the Enlightenment most likely does not represent a break, but illustrates an experience of continuity that they share. For the exhibition's opening, the National Museum had a surprise in store, a 10-meter tall statue of the long-suppressed philosopher Confucius. He discoursed upon the importance of knowledge and learning two and a half thousand years ago, an early signal of China's own enlightenment. Or it may simply be a reminder that progress is only possible through curiosity, prosperity through individual initiative, and success through ingenuity. European Enlightenment made history as an epoch of emancipation. Emancipation of the individual, of science and the arts. Denis Diderot published his encyclopedia, a first data bank of general knowledge. Museums were created that were open to the public. There were visions of an education through the arts. The exhibition China and the Art of the Enlightenment will be accompanied by a flurry of lectures and discussion forums. It could hardly be expected not to put ideas about education, freedom, and individualism squarely into the spotlight in Beijing. But does it have a real chance at reaching its target audience? I'm sure Tiananmen Square is one of the world's best known squares. And this exhibition is being held in this profoundly political spot with a profoundly political theme of the Enlightenment. This is an exhibition that's very conspicuously taking place at the same time as the opening of the renovated museum there. 
And it must be quite a heavy burden to be carrying around. You'd have to strike just exactly the right note to put across the right message. The art of the Enlightenment before the eyes of the great chairman Mao Zedong, on the very same square where the demonstrations for democracy and transparency came to a blood-soaked end. Culture is always political, and the political is always a matter of culture.